Hello, my name is Wayne Callen. On behalf of the Attitude team, I'm pleased to welcome you to today's ADHB experts presentation. It is titled Shedding Labels, Shedding Shame, How to Unlock Powerful ADHD Accommodations with Acceptance. ADHD accommodations help level the playing field at school, but sometimes they also work to alienate a child with ADHD from his or her peers. In fact, many of these students often feel shame when discussing their accommodations. To ensure that students continue to use the resources that benefit them most, educators and parents must adopt strategies that foster acceptance by celebrating the differences we all have. Leading today's presentation is Tom Bergeron. Tom is the co-founder of Inventive Labs in Amesbury, Massachusetts. Tom and co-founder Rick Fiery created Inventive Labs because of their passion for helping young adults with learning differences find alternative paths to success. Programs include gap year and entrepreneurship offerings designed to explore careers or create new businesses in an all accepting environment. Tom is committed to helping the next generation find their path forward and launch their careers. He believes it isn't a race to the finish line but a journey of learning and exploration to find a livelihood that offers fulfillment and success. Before starting Inventive Labs, Tom launched a number of innovative products while leading sales, marketing, and product development teams. Before I hand over the microphone to Tom, I have just a few housekeeping items. Those of you tuned into the live webinar may download the slides now by clicking on the event resources section of your webinar screen. And if you're interested in the certificate of attendance option, look for instructions in the email you'll receive around an after, after the live broad, broadcast, sorry, after an hour after the live broadcast. If you are listening in replay or podcast mode, visit attitudemag.com and search podcast 377 to access the slides, the webinar replay, and the certificate of attendance option. If you support the work we're doing here at Attitude to strengthen the ADHD community, we encourage you to visit attitudemag.com slash subscribe and sign up for Attitude Magazine for your family or to share with a teacher or a loved one who could benefit from greater understanding of ADHD. Finally, the sponsor of this week's webinar is Inflow. Inflow is the number one app to help you manage your ADHD. Developed by leading clinicians, Inflow is a science-based self-help program based on the principles of cognitive behavioral therapy. You can download Inflow now on the App Store and Google Play Store. Attitude thanks our sponsors for supporting our webinars. Sponsorship has no influence on speaker selection or webinar content. So without further ado, I'm pleased to welcome Tom Bergeron. Thank you so much for joining us today, Tom and leading this discussion. Thanks, Wayne. I'm honored that Attitude Magazine would invite me to be part of their expert webinar series, especially where I don't necessarily match the credentials of many of your experts. I don't necessarily have a PhD or other initials after my name. But what I do have is I do have experience of working with many, many young adults um, who have ADHD. And I also kind of have some of my own personal experiences to draw on as well. And I think maybe what I'll do is just maybe talk, start this by talking about a story of three generations of students that struggled with learning differences. The first generation would be my father. You know, I knew him as a successful man, a natural engineer that could pre build pretty much anything. But when we talked about his years in school, he painted a different story. He went to school in the 1930s, large classrooms, 40 students or so. He was high energy and lacked focus. It wasn't a good combination. Um, the teachers didn't have the time or the resources to help him with the accommodations he needed. And worse than that, he also felt bullied. He felt bullied by his classmates, but he also felt bullied by the teachers themselves. So if you fast forward to the next generation, which would be me, I went to school, a Catholic school in the 70s and 80s. There was no such thing as accommodations back then, especially in our school system, um, which was unfortunate. 
I struggled through my elementary years um, with some challenges um, with learning and keeping up with the content. But what I did have is I felt I had acceptance. The teachers appreciated the energy that I had, and there also was no tolerance for bullying. I contrast that to my son in school, the third generation. For him, he went to school in the 2000s. He had an IEP by the time he was four years old. He had all the accommodations he could ask for, which was great. It actually helped him a lot in the academics in the early years. But then an interesting thing happened. As he progressed in school, especially in high school, he no longer wanted the accommodations. They had him feel different from the other students, not part of the class. He pushed back on them and didn't want to use them. So in that experience that I went through in my son, it kind of helped in the founding of Inventive Labs, which I founded in 2014 along with Rick Fiery. Our goal was to work with college-age students, giving them a gap year, helping them identify careers they could go into or start their own businesses. What we saw working with these individuals is they were really worn down by the education system. Um, like my son and others, they often struggled with accommodations, but their self-confidence was low. And really what we did, we built a program to help them find their path forward. But probably more important, we built a program that provided acceptance and helped them build their self-confidence back up. So this isn't a story that's unique to the lab. It's not unique to my family. It's a story that's out there for many folks. One of the Dear Attitude um, letters that came in earlier this year really caught my attention. So in the letter, the parents said, our daughter absolutely doesn't want the school to know about her ADHD. She fears that her peers will find out. So Eileen Bailey and Penny Williams answered that, and I think they did a great job. They said that they see why their daughter didn't want to tell the school about the ADHD. She might be afraid of ridicule or feeling different. They said children want to be accepted, and I wholeheartedly agree with that. They gave some great advice for the parents, and I really liked how they end, ended that advice. They ended it by ex asking them to explain to their daughter that the diagnosis of ADHD isn't anything to be ashamed of, and that you and your spouse are proud of her and love her no matter what. Their recommendation was to build acceptance in their own household, in their own family, um, to help their child. And you know, we'd say even you know, building that into the child, having their own self-acceptance, where they can step forward with their ADHD diagnosis. So this isn't something that just happens in the school environment. This is something that often is carried forward with folks in their life. So Jared Blank, a highly successful individual by anyone's standard, he actually did the World Marathon Challenge. If you're not familiar with that, that is running seven marathons on seven continents in seven days back to back. So seven back to back marathons. The picture here shows him finishing the last marathon in Antarctica. He was also successful academically. He had graduate degrees from Seattle Pacific University, USC. He actually worked with Pete Carroll, the uh, championship coach from USC. Trojans, and actually continue working with Pete Carroll onto the professional football team in Seattle Seahawks. The interesting thing is Jared wrote a book about his, um, or Jared is dyslexic, and he wrote his book, a book about his experience with dyslexia called Running the Distance. And in that book, he talks about some of his challenges in his younger years, but he also talks about the stigma he had associated with the resource room in high school. This was a similar story that my son experienced. By the time he was in high school, he didn't want anything to do with the resource room. Even as an adult, he looked back and wished that he didn't have to be in the resource room when he was in school. It kind of brings me to a quote that I'm very fond on by Christina Baker Klein. She says, the older I get, the more I believe that the greatest kindness is acceptance. She doesn't say helping others. She says accepting others, accepting who they are. You can then build helping on top of that, but the greatest kindness in itself is on acceptance. It's something that we've known for a long time. Anyone who's taken a psychology class in high school has seen Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So after your physical needs and the need for safety, love and belonging 
becomes the next component of the pyramid. It's really what you need. You need belonging before you can continue on with growth in your life. And that's something I feel strongly that we need within all our school systems. So what is the difference between accommodations and acceptance? How do those two things tie together? What I like to do is share a story that I heard. I was at an event um, for autism in the workplace. And during the Q&A with the audience, one of the audience members stood up and told a story that really stuck with me. She talked about her daughter who had physical challenges. And one of those was limited how much she could write. So as she was going to third grade, it was really holding her back from her classmates and her peers. And what they were able to do, the school was able to get a special chair for her, a chair that gave the ability for her to be able to write and keep up with her peers. The school was happy with this. The parents were happy. And the student herself was happy that she now had this accommodation to keep up. But then something interesting happened. During step-up day, when the third graders go to meet their fourth grade teacher, the teacher asked her about how things were going. She did mention the cheer. And while the teacher thought it might be a positive statement, she talked about the negative side. She talked about how that cheer made her feel different, how she didn't feel like she fit in the classroom. You see, everyone else had the same cheer. She was the only one in the classroom that was different. She was surprised when she stepped into fourth grade that year. The teacher over the summer had spent time going out and collecting a whole series of chairs. When she walked in the classroom, everybody had a different chair to sit at. She no longer felt unique. Or she was unique, but no longer felt different and separated from her peers because everyone was unique. Everyone had a different place they could sit. She had an amazing fourth year. Her growth really accelerated kind of from that point forward. So the acceptance that that fourth grade teacher gave her was a key to unlocking her accommodations and her learning. For ADHD, students don't necessarily have a chair, but there are other things and things that folks recognize in the classroom. They may go to the resource room. If they're taking tests, they might go to a different area. There might be some special timers or math manipulators available on their desk. And there's usually, if they have an IEP, some paraprofessionals around the room to specifically help them. So it's different, but it's still the same components that may separate you from the other classmates. So I would contend that the accommodation-based system does not foster belonging. So with that being the case, you know, what brought about the current accommodation system? And more importantly, what can we do about it? So let's start off as far as kind of how a system got built. If you ask folks what a good student is, or even just doing a little bit of research out on the web, you'll hear a lot of different things like a love of learning, an inquisitive child. But you also find things like you know, confidence goes a long way and also self-discipline. So I agree, these are all things that will make a good student. But if you look at what's rewarded in the classroom, it might be a little bit different. You know, it may be organization skills that become in strong, self-control, both verbal and physical. Definitely staying on topic makes life a lot easier for the teachers. I think back to my father's classroom with 40 students in the 1930s, and this definitely would have been rewarded uh, even more so than it is today. But it's still a reality of the classroom and things that make a, student's, a teacher's job a bit easier. So what we'll see is that students with ADHD exhibit a lot of the traits of a good student, that love of learning, that in inquisitiveness, that curiosity that's kind of built in. But what we often see in our school systems is they weren't necessarily designed for, I'd even say, by folks with ADHD. I will say there are some wonderful schools out there, some that were probably designed by folks with AD, ADHD that have built in kind of an acceptance environment. But I think a lot of the components of our public school system, there's challenges in pulling that off. But fortunately, in the 1970s, the government stepped in and helped work on leveling the playing field. So in 1973, they had the Rehabilitation Act. Many of, you, many of you might be most familiar with it as far as Section 504. 
your child or your student may have a 504 plan. And those plans are basically put in place so that there's no barriers for students to learning. And in 1975, they kind of took the next level on that, an act that was originally called Education for All Handicapped Children Act was put into place. There's been many revisions to that. It's been reauthorized and modified more than once. You'll probably know it as the IDEA Act. It's the legislation that puts IEP plans, individualized education plans in place. It's where the concept of accommodations and modifications is built off of. So I realize many of you are familiar with IEPs and 504s, but I do want to touch upon it quickly. Um, I was familiar with them for many years, but not necessarily the different aspects. So this is a um, from an article in Smart Kids with LD with Eve Kessler and Michelle Snyder put together. And they talk about accommodations being a combination of variations of time, basically adapting the time allotted for different tasks. And then also variations for input and variation for output, basically how instruction is delivered and how students can respond. And the fourth component is a variation of size. So basically adapting the number of items that students are expected to complete. So accommodations are a bit different than modifications. Modifications actually go in and change what the student is expected to learn. That might be you know, altering the content or the instruction level or performance criteria um, that they're given. Some examples of some of you may be familiar with, and again, we're advocates of accommodations. We feel this helps students. So an accommodation could be a pair or someone else scribing notes for them. Untimed test, which a lot of people are familiar with, is one of those. Modifications might be using, instead of reading text, using film or video, or maybe a computerized spell checker being available for that child. So I am happy to celebrate that it's almost 50 years of leveling the playing field. And we think there's been a lot of great steps in that time frame. But when I look at the system, I can't help but think this system was obviously created by the adults. And why do I say that? I say that because I think it's a very practical with the accommodations. There's things that help students learn better. But if it was created by the children, I'd like to go back and kind of look at the letter that was sent into Dear Attitude. If it was created around for, by the children, they'd probably be more tied into acceptance. They'd probably be more tuned in to what's happening as far as not having their peers identify you know, their learning differences, you know, save, protecting themselves from ridicule and fear. So I would say the system has a lot of challenges. The children might create a different one than the adults did. And I also want to point out this time that the system isn't the teachers. I have a ton of respect for teachers. My wife has been an elementary and middle school teacher for many years, um, and hence many of our friends are teachers as well. I understand how difficult the job they do and the challenges that are out in the classroom with many students. I just love this quote by Donald D. Quinn. He says, if a doctor, lawyer, or dentist had 40 people in their office at one time, all of whom had different needs, and some who didn't want to be there and were causing trouble, then that doctor, lawyer, or dentist might just have some concept of the classroom teacher's job. And I agree with that. We put a lot on our teacher's plate, and we give them a system, a system that limits what they can do quite often. When I talk about the system, I more talk about how our schools run. And I just look in special education and look at the language that you use, starting off with special education. The word special, as many of you know, has grown a negative connotation, the special bus, the special students. Disability, definitely not a positive, enriching word. Accommodations themselves, those are given to folks that are lacking. Modifications, I find a decent word. And handicapped, there's a lot of connotations with that as well. So in our school system, I would advocate, maybe it's just education we have, education for all. Maybe we highlight differences as opposed to disabilities. I love the word alternatives as opposed to accommodations. Alternatives sounds like something we could all use. We all have different ways of doing things. 
as opposed to accommodations where only certain people need it to level the playing field. Again, modifications I find a strong word. And instead of handicap, we like the language of challenges that folks have, and we all have challenges that we need to work with. When I talk about the system, you're also looking at resources. So you don't get money from the federal government if you have a student that has a learning difference. You only get it if they have a documented learning disability. So there's a money flow aspect that's tied into the system. And also, as we all know, with money comes restrictions. It limits what you can do and how you can handle that. And when someone has an IEP, it definitely limits the way that schools can spend their money. The other component that ties into system is also standards. Standardized testing, school districts being judged uh, by the same standard. I'll go back and talk a little bit when we talk about some of the things that can be done in accommodations of the classroom and realize that some are with standardized testing need to be in place at certain times, but it doesn't take away what can happen overall in the classroom. I would also say kind of an often unseen consequence of the system is competition. So this one I find interesting. I see a lot of schools that celebrate the colleges that their seniors get into, this competition among the students. They list the colleges that their students are getting into up along a wall. So the students are in there for their own good, but also they're competing for their own school and the image of their school from the colleges they get into. And also, let's be honest, also in there for their parents. What parent, myself included, isn't proud when their child gets into a high-end university or high-end college? So when you have this type of competition, it naturally brings out jealousy when someone has advantages. <clears throat> and can't you kind of say that with accommodations and modifications? There's certain school students that may have advantages. And that, you know, that atmosphere that's built with jealousy and differences often puts on the student who has the IEP the feeling that they are cheating. So Jared Blank had that, that feeling that he was cheating using the resource room. And I mentioned my son as well grew to the point where he pushed back on IEPs. And definitely when he was in college, he pushed back on accommodations in college because he specifically said it felt like he was cheating the system. So the big question is, how do you foster acceptance when the system has built-in barriers? I would contend that it can be done. I think there's many individuals that have ADHD or other learning differences that are not ashamed of them, and actually in some cases are proud of them. Simone Biles, the world-famous gymnast, now she has ADHD and she's open about talking about it. And she's not ashamed of either having ADHD or even the medicine that she needs to take for it. Some people have said that medicine was given her an unfair advantage. She said, no, there's nothing to be ashamed of. It's what I need to be able to perform and perform at a high level. So what you'll see in that case is there's an adult who has embraced and not ashamed of their ADHD. But how do we do that for children in the classroom? So when we formed Inventive Labs, we were very um, set on creating an open environment. We actually went through and documented the things we felt would create an open environment. We also talked to teachers and classroom teachers as well, going through and finding out what are the elements they would see as far as an environment that would be accepting um, for their students. We went and built together, uh, built a school acceptance checklist. This is actually in the event resources. If you're interested, you can download it. I don't expect you to read all the things on the screen. I'll let you run through and kind of share some of those components with you now. So the first thing in that checklist we talk about is it all starts with language. So someone may need to have a documented disability to get that IEP, to get the federal funding to kind of help out. But in the school set setting, once they have the IEP, we don't have to talk about disabilities. We can talk about differences rather than disabilities. And this in itself can be very powerful. And also just the language that we continue to build off of that as well. I think it's not unusual for some of the teachers I talk to that a colleague comes up and says, 
oh, so-and-so was a real handful. Maybe Pat was a real handful. These teachers actively practice staying in a positive tone. So they might say, yes, Pat is one of my more active students. They might even take it a step further. They might say, yes, Pat's very active, but he's also great at math. It was wonderful seeing him today help some of the other students solve a problem. So positive language goes a long way in that. And it may be in a case where someone lacks focus. Instead of Angel lacking focus, Angel might be very curious about many subjects. So building an environment where people try and use positive language and also the ability to kind of somewhat call each other out on that when they're not goes a long way. There's a large movement that we support, which is people first language. So this is really putting the person, the individual, before um, what their challenges might be. So someone would be dis would have dyslexia as opposed to being dyslexic. Dys dyslexic defines you specifically as the person. When you, someone has dyslexia, they're defined as the many things they do as a person who happens to have dyslexia as well. And there's also the concept of putting ability versus disability. So it can be an accessible bathroom as opposed to the handicapped bathroom. One of the components, or the second component on the checklist really ties into embracing differences. And I think the key here is acknowledging that we all have strengths and we all have challenges. The valedictorian of the high school has challenges. It might be in the classroom, it might be outside of it. It might be challenges in art or music or athletics or social skills, et cetera. There's probably something that shows up there. But more than likely, there's also challenges in certain subjects. It's very likely they worked harder in one subject than they did in some of the others that might have come more naturally to them. So we do talk about each year having teachers lead a discussion on how we're all different. And again, difference is the key word here. It's not a better or worse. It's not a ranking system. It's really how we have differences. And this should be a message that's reinforced throughout the year. And I would say this aspect isn't just for the struggling students. This is all students. If I go back to that valedictorian, if I go back to the top students in the classroom, there's often a lot of anxiety that shows up. There's a lot of pressure to get that. And the ability to have discussions around we all have challenges, we all have struggle, relieves just a little bit of that pressure. At the lab, we've definitely worked with struggling students, but we've also worked with a lot of top-end students. And that pressure, that anxiety that built up um, has been a challenge for them as well. So the ability to embrace differences, to acknowledge that we all have challenges, goes a long way for all the students in a classroom. So how do you go about embracing the differences? There's multiple ways. One of the ways that we really like is there's a lot of tools that can be used with middle schoolers and high school. And these, the great thing is these have no cost associated with them. So you can use free assessment tools that are out there. There's a lot of personality tests, whether it be Myers-Briggs or the DISC assessment or the Big Five. And what we like about using these is these can really foster a discussion on differences. It's because these type tests don't rank results. They just put people in different categories. And we can share and compare the categories we're in. And we can share and compare how that has us make different decisions and kind of work and have different work preferences. You'll also see in high school, in many cases, students are taking aptitude uh, tests, are really called career assessment tests, that identify their aptitudes, whether they be the Holland Code or career personality profilers. So these tests also break people in categories. Basically, they're looking at your aptitudes to see which jobs work well. The good ones, and most of them, don't rank the aptitudes. They do them a comparison of that individual person. It really opens up a discussion. And we think classroom teachers can use this discussion around career tests to have a lot of a bigger discussion around how we're all different and how that adds more to the, to the overall environment. You know, I love doctors and nurse, nurses, but we can't have an entire world made up of doctors and nurses. There's some people with the aptitude for that, they should go there, and other people with aptitudes in different areas. This type thing can also be done with younger students. It doesn't have to wait till the students are old enough to do aptitude tests. So discussing differences in the classroom can happen continuously. You know, a teacher can ask, who likes group projects? Who likes working alone? Different way of maybe the aptitude tests that may come up with 
introvert versus extrovert or a blend between introvert and extrovert. And the students can start seeing that, hey, we all prefer different things. You, know, you can even go to who likes working with their hands, who likes working on the computer. There's all kind of different ways to go through and have students identify and acknowledge their differences. Students naturally like to do this. This is an exercise that kind of works real well. And in some of these components, um, you may end up with all the students raising their hand and seeing there's a lot of commonality across them. You can tell the environment when you walk in a classroom, you can tell an environment that embraces difference, differences. Um, students tend to be very open with their challenges. Students talk about what makes them unique. And it's great to be a classroom environment where this has been embraced. The third aspect on the checklist ties into fostering respect and accountability. We think one great way to do this is with social and emotional learning programs. I'm really happy that a lot of schools are implementing these and they're becoming quite popular. There's a lot of different programs and we don't necessarily advocate one over the other. What I will say is this is a topic that could be an entire webinar to itself. There's a lot that goes into it. Now, if you wanna learn more, I might direct you to the CASEL website where they have a lot of great information on social and emotional learning. But really what it comes into is kind of some five different major elements. So working with a child for both their own self-assessment and self-management of themselves. Also the social aspect of, this, of the child, their social awareness and also their relationship skills. And then tying that together into responsible decision-making. For schools that have implemented this, what you see is you see students that have a lot more you know, self-esteem and self-knowledge, but you'll also find an environment built in the school um, that is much more open, much more accepting, um, just a wonderful environment uh, to be in. And on the other side of fostering respect and accountability, we basically advocate zero tolerance, and tolerance when it comes to harassment. So most schools would say this. I don't think you find many schools out there that say that they uh, accept bullying, but I think there are differences in how it's done. I think you should be aware that your school does have clear guidelines on what those policy looks like. What is bullying? What is harassment? And what are the consequences? And the key here is that there's follow through on those consequences. Without the follow through, bullying and harassment will continue. There's another interesting aspect, kind of a little bit of a side I say on the checklist. And I would say it's the opportunity to allow students to show leadership and expertise. There's multiple ways that can be done. It can be done by letting a student present an area where they do have some expertise or maybe leading some type of activity that they're very familiar with to build leadership skills. We do something at Inventive Labs that we call a passion presentation. I would say a lot of our students don't look forward to it. Pre present presenting is not something a lot of people like to do. But in our case, weekly, we have folks do it. These presentations really come off quite positive when they're done. One that sticks out in my mind is one of our students came from a military family. In fact, he went off to be a soldier after he left our program. When he did his passion presentation, he actually did it on poetry to surprise our entire team. He shared poetry that he liked, but he also shared many poems that he wrote himself. It was a pivotal moment for that team that year bonding when the strong military individual opened up and shared his love of poetry. It allowed the other folks to open up and share some of their likes and dislikes as well, some that they might have hidden from the group otherwise. So this ability to do this not only is great for the students, but it builds a great environment. And the fourth component that ties in, and this kind of a strong component, is how do you build the accommodations into the classroom themselves to keep them as accepting? So I think one of the key tenets for that is to provide the accommodations for all the students, not just the labeled students. All students should be able to have the accommodations. There's a concept called universal design. Again, this is a concept that could be a webinar in itself, uh, but it is the tools that designing for all helps the design for everyone. What you'll find when you do this is you'll find that students who don't need these accommodations, they just won't use them. 
they're not needed and they don't use them. I will say this particular thing will likely receive a lot of pushback. You'll get comments like, whoa, whoa, you're holding back um, the stronger students. You may get comments like you're dumbing down the classroom. How can that be done? And I just would contend that's not the case. That's not the way it works. And I would look at you know, my experiences in the workplace. I don't think there's a company out there that would not allow their carpenters to use a nail gun. I don't think they want physical rigor, so you have to use a hammer that isn't done and isn't efficient. I don't see account accounting for firms touting that their accountants do the math themselves by hand, that they don't use spreadsheets or they don't use calculators. That just doesn't make sense. They're most efficient and they get the most out of the tools that are there. And I think it's the same in the workplace. I'll use an example for myself personally. So I went to a high school that valued vocabulary and spelling. I appreciate that because I feel my vocabulary is stronger by going there. But I never did become a good speller, no matter how they tried and no matter what techniques they used. Spell check for me in the workplace actually was a difference maker. It actually helped me learn how to spell words correctly. Continually spelling the wrong word and getting corrected leads for me learning on how to do that. So it's a tool for learning. Actually, kind of ironically, I continually spelled, misspelled the word accommodations during this presentation. Interesting as an expert to kind of be presenting. I always put an A instead of an O after the two M's. But by putting this presentation together and spell check, I now can spell accommodations correctly. So some examples of those accommodations in the classroom. So we really are not big fans of paraprofessionals working specifically with the special ed students on giving them extra scaffold folding. We really think the classroom teacher should share those things with the entire class. It doesn't take much time and it goes a long way. We also look at things like quiet spots and not just reserving those for the students that have a diagnosis, but letting any student. What we've seen is when you reserve them for certain students, there's a stigma that becomes attached and suddenly no one uses them. We find when you open them up for all students, yeah, Maybe at the beginning, everyone's kind of fighting for it. But over time, only the students that really need a quiet spot that makes a difference are the ones that are going to be using them. And maybe, just maybe, some of those students that don't have an IEP or 504 plan may find that as a great place to get their work done. There's lots of other examples that go into it as far as um, accommodations that are given to some students that we feel could be given to all students. Why not give all students the definition of words necessary to understand? Why not show examples of the final products to everyone? We all know the strategy of breaking down large assignments into smaller sections. So why not incorporate that with the entire class as opposed to just working on that strategy with a few? And the manipulators are out there. I'll go back to the work environment with the calculators and the nail guns. Use the tools that make the project most efficient and best to use. One thing a lot of teachers talked to us about, too, was this time-based, extra time for certain students and the ways they addressed it. So taking tests and making them compromised of must-dos and try-tos. So all students must do the must-dos. Those who are faster and get done early, they can do try-tos. Again, for us, we think this instills some academic rigor. For the students who can get through and want more challenge, they have it right there on the test in front of them. And on non-test and other assignments that folks work on, it's natural in a classroom, especially a large classroom, for some folks to finish earlier than others. So again, putting in place projects that those students who finish first can work on. Again, this instills that level learning, what we talked about as a good student early on, a level learning to be able to work on some of the projects that you have the most interest in. So these accommodations, the strategies, now go back to the story on the special chair. I say using the accommodations in this way is actually helpful for all students. And looking at accommodations of how can you take out the stigma from that accommodation? How can you make things available to all students? Or when it can't be for all students, how do you build it in the environment that everyone is kind of working differently? That whole conversation of embracing differences can be incorporated in the classroom. So if accommodations can be done this way, 
You won't have individuals like my son or you won't have Jared Blank pushing back on the resource room when they're in high school. What you may have is you may have all students have an interest in being there. There isn't necessarily a stigma going to the library the same way there is the resource room. So this strategy of acceptance can kind of go a long way. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to wrap up with a call to action. What I'd like to say is continue to fight for accommodations. We're big fans of it. You know, a lot of you out there have fought for accommodations and it's made a difference. But I ask that you also fight even harder for acceptance. The ability to go out there and push for acceptance that the accommodations are given in a way that all students feel accepted. So the experts right now will tell me I should end my presentation on the call to action. But I think I might be remiss if I do that right now. Because what I will say is for the folks listening, you all have busy lives, whether you're a parent, trying to juggle being a parent in your work schedule, and any time you can give towards advocating your school, or whether you're a teacher that has a ton on your plate, it's tough just keeping your classroom going, never, never mind fighting for higher or more accommodations um, throughout the entire school or more acceptance throughout the entire school. So what I would say is let's go back to the letter, the Dear Attitude letter, and what we can do in addition to fighting for accommodations acceptance, we can also work with the students and our children that we work directly with. We can help to explain to them that their diagnosis, ADHD or other, isn't something to be ashamed of and that we're proud of them and that we love them. That's kind of the internal acceptance that we can give them as we try and build larger acceptance into the classroom and the overall school environment. And I would say taking that a step further, in the event resources, there's also a document you may see, which is reframing for self-esteem. What we've seen for the students that come to us after high school, quite often they're worn down from the system. Their self-confidence is low, which I think I mentioned earlier. We find a concept called reframing goes a long way. It's really helping the individuals reframe a mindset. And it starts, something we can all do, you know, discuss and identify the challenges that our children or your students are going through. And also having the discussion, which we often don't have, that there's often negative self-talk that comes from this. An example might be, hey, Tom, why are you always late? You know, it makes it difficult for you and for other people. So we have this self-talk mechanism that does not make things better. And the way to combat this is to go through brainstorming kind of from a positive side of the challenge. So Tom, I may be late, but it's because I live in the moment. I live in the now. There's entire books and resources that are built on the power of living in now. So there's a positive side to that. And it leads me to be able to reframe from when I get down on myself. Maybe I do give a minute or two to be down on myself for being late, but I can turn that around and not have it ruin my entire day by reframing from that mindset of why am I always late to a mindset of I may be late, but it's great I live in, live in the now. It allows me to stay optimistic and other people like to be around me based on that attitude. And of course, that practice continues reframing when times are difficult and working with your child and student um, when they're in a moment where they're low. So again, this is probably something we could go through an entire webinar on itself, but definitely want to introduce that concept because we don't all have the time or the energy to make all the changes we want in the classroom. And the one last point I'll make before I wrap up, or one last thing I'll mention before I wrap up and go to questions, is I kind of ended the story with my son that he was done with school and, he, and with high school. I am happy to say that today he's recently turned 26. After taking a little break from school, he actually is now an alumni of both Inventive Labs through our program, as well as the University of New Hampshire. And as we speak, he's at a university, Full Sail University in Florida, going for his master's in game design. And I do call out you know, Full Sail specifically because they are an institution that really accepts folks for who they are, fully accepting and embracing kind of folks with different challenges. And I think that's encouraging. I want to mention that because I do feel there's a lot of organizations that are out there, whether it be schools, universities, workplaces, that do foster this acceptance, that go through a lot of things that I've talked about in the presentation today. And I would say find those organizations, kind of work with them, and I think it would be wonderful for your students 
your children, and yourself to be part of those. So with that, Wayne, I'd like to turn it over to you and see if uh, there's any questions. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, very inspiring. Um, one question. What do you think of my daughter's high school putting all kids with an IEP in a class called special education? My, my daughter only has an accommodating IEP, and that classification turned her off completely. How do I approach the school about the name that they've given this room? Yeah, I think that's a, a big challenge. As I said, language is kind of a, give, is a big component of kind of what happens. And I think, you know, it's definitely separating. I think, you know, my own son, he had that experience in very first grade. They kind of took the group of four students and kind of separated them from much of the rest of the classroom. And it was a big challenge. And, you know, the advice for there, I think, is, you know, address the school. I think a lot of times you have folks in the industry in the school that may push back and have different philosophies. But I think quite often you'll find individuals that match your philosophy or match what you're looking for. And I think spending time and asking questions and finding some of those advocates in the school to work with is a big component of it. Um, and I also think, and especially in high school, helping some of the students advocate for themselves. Not all school students want to do it or can do it, but helping them find their voice um, from there as well. So I think, you know, it's a challenge, but I think working with the school, potentially bringing in some other professionals beside yourself to work with the school to see if you can't kind of make some changes there. Okay, well, you brought it up. How do you teach your child to advocate for him or herself? Do you rehearse at home? Do you work up a script? Can you give some specifics about that? Yeah, and I think that, um, I think as you said, um, rehearsing at home goes a very big way. I think the more you do it, the better you get at it. And it can be in multiple areas. Um, I'd say, you know, reverse that with yourself and have them help advocate. Have them help advocate for things they do around the house, for things they want to do or don't want to do, whether it be chores or kind of activities they want to do, you know, requiring them to advocate for themselves. But then also expanding that as well out to friends and family. If you can start having them advocate over a friend's house, for what they want. Quite often students will, or children will just go along with what's happening in other houses. But the ability for them to you know, use their voice and share with um, relatives and friends' houses to advocate and then slowly build that up in school. I do think it's a lot to ask the child to advocate in school. And I think especially at their age, you kind of have authority figures and it's tough to advocate to authority figures. But kind of working with them that you can't advocate elsewhere and eventually building that into the classroom um, goes a long way. Mm -hmm. uh, another question. When requesting a 504 for my son, such as written instructions for all assignments, the counselor said, well, that's something that all teachers should be doing anyway, so we shouldn't need a plan for that. The 504 coordinator at the same school felt that asking teachers to put assignments in writing was asking too much of them. So what's... How does one go about uh, changing that? Yeah, I, I'm a big advocate for actually having those components in the plan. Because if they're not in the plan, they don't necessarily have to be accommodated to. And I'll go back to what I said about teachers. I have a lot of respect and admiration for teachers. They have a lot in their plate. But I do think something like putting written assignments, that just helps all students. It's not necessarily the students with 504s or IEPs. That's a great way to do to help all students. Um, so... You know, working with the teacher themselves, working with the school to build those in kind of goes a long way. And I think definitely what I'm hearing you know, from these questions is frustration from parents who are trying to work with the schools and not necessarily getting the des results they they desire. Mm -hmm. And I think that's you know, it's a long-term process to continue. Quite often it turns into fights with schools, and I think that can be negative. I think, you know, working and trying to find where there's common ground with the folks in the school, as I said, talk to a few different professionals, sounds like in this specific questions that had different opinions, but finding the ones that will advocate for you. And also looking forward, if the school knows you're advocating for certain things, as they place your child in future years, they'll know what you're looking for. And it may help with, it may not help in the moment, but it may help with placements as you go forward. Uh -huh. um, another person has said, I love the promise of what you're saying. I'm a recently diagnosed adult and feel many of the things you were describing as the experience of a child at school would also work in the workplace. At work, I have an assessment to identify what reasonable adjustments can be made so that I can be more like everyone else. 
what can I do here? Can I employ some of the um, wisdom and advice you've given in the workplace? Yeah, actually, it's interesting in the workplace because the workplace is a little bit different than necessarily the school environment. Schools often children have a set school they need to go to and you kind of work through them. I think in the workplace, there is more flexibility where you have some choice in where you may work. I realize there's dream jobs that people want to work on and dream companies and you want to fit in there. But when we work with the college age students to identify the careers they're going into, we really have them take a strong look at the companies they want to work with. And a lot of companies with a lot of different company culture out there. You know, some companies do very part of who they are is working on those personality assessment tools or working with different tools um, that's given there. So if you can actually find a company that matches your philosophy and embraces diversity, there's actually a lot of tech companies now um, that are out there that, um, whether it be, you know, Microsoft or SAP or even some of the big accounting firms like EY that have neurodiversity hiring programs. One of our you know, one of our alumni was hired by EY as part of their neuro neurodiversity program um, in Boston. So in their case, they weren't just accommodating, they were actually celebrating the diversity and what it brought to the company and actually have a department of folks that bring kind of diversity and bring their unique skills to solve problems. So I would say, you know, if you love the job you're in and you're working with it, kind of work with your managers and work to bring that accepting environment throughout some of the things that I talked about, but also you know, don't be afraid to look for companies out there that kind of match your own strengths and you know, areas that might mitigate the challenges that you have. Mm -hmm. Is there a clearinghouse or directory where you can find these uh, neurodiverse friendly companies that you know I of? I don't know if there necessarily is. I think mm -hmm. if you do some... Um, a little bit of research on the web. I think you can do neurodiverse hiring or sometimes it's autism at work is, is how a lot of them started, but they've expanded now to uh, beyond autism. So that is an avenue that you can kind of find. I mm -hmm. think when you do tap into some of the companies, like SAP was one of the first ones that I was aware of. They help kind of lead you to the path down to other companies like Microsoft and others that have kind of built these programs. There are specifically companies, uh, Specialist Stern is what I'm thinking about, that actually helps facilitate hiring as well. So there are companies out there that um, their special their role is working with companies to make them more inclusive and also trying to find individuals to help those companies hire. Mm -hmm. uh, one parent is asking, and perhaps your own experience would, would shed some light on this, how can I help my two sons accept that ADHD will make many parts of their lives more difficult? but that it is not the only part of who they are. Yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a great point, and it's tough kind of working with children to do that. But I think some of the strategies that we employ, I think when you're a, children, you, a child, you kind of have this vision that, you know, I go to school, get good grades, I then go to college and get good grades so I can go to work at a good company, and that's kind of the path. What our experience is, my own experience and others, is that your path tends to be your journey. And one thing we like to do is we like to bring professionals into lab, people who are established in their careers, but let them tell their story. And it's amazing what those stories look like. There's a lot of twists and turns. There's a lot of these folks might be a doctor or a lawyer that looks highly successful, and they show their challenges they had in school as well. So I think when you give the challenge some role models of folks who could be there, and I think if they're younger students, you know, you can even introduce them to high schoolers. If they're college, high schoolers, maybe introduce them to college students, folks who have shared their challenges and have been able to uh, push through it. And also can talk in a positive light, talk about the positive things that, you know, come about it. Um, I can talk about, you know, my challenges of, you know, my struggle in school, you know, attention issues, but also just uh, challenges around, uh, you know, a lot of dyslexic traits and how that just added a bit of, you know, um, persistence for me, kind of getting through that, that is something that carried through into my own life. So I think having some adults who've struggled or older individuals than them that have struggled, kind of share their stories, talk about their own struggles, but also talk about where they got to. I think it just gives, I think what happens a lot with children, they never see themselves being successful because of the current challenges they're having in school. Mm hmm yeah, I've often heard advice, I guess, from parents when we've asked the question at Attitude that uh, one way to get more acceptance and accommodations in the classroom is not maybe not go global, but actually just talk, sit down and have a one on one with the teacher who may be more cooperative and, and is right there with the child. 
and can be more helpful and working out an agreement that way. I'm not saying instead of an IEP, but sometimes IEPs aren't enforced or implemented, I should say. So what about the one-on-one -on -one experience with the teacher in terms of accomplishing ex getting more acceptance and accommodation? Yeah, I think if you, know, if you put yourself in the shoes of the teacher, you know, especially if they have multiple IEPs and they have, you know, they have a lot of components that are coming down from them kind of from, from above. We want you to be project-based learning. We want you to be universal design. We want you this, we want you that. There's a lot coming at them. There's a lot that they're often asked to do in the classroom and standardized testing has really limited, um, you know, some of the flexibility they have in the classroom. So there's a lot of, you know, pressures that are coming from them. And sometimes when those things come from above, it doesn't get the response that you want. So, you know, we're big advocates, whether it be during, you know, teacher, parent teacher meetings or whether it be, you know, separate meetings that you set up is to sit down with the teacher and kind of step through from your opinion. It's great if your child can advocate, but also kind of from your view of what you've seen in the past or what you see and how that's helped the child. I think, you know, teachers gone in the professions for a reason. They want to help others. They want to help students kind of live a better life. And I think if you can kind of break down some of the other barriers and talk about where the help is or how, you know, where assistance might come for the teacher just goes a real long way. Again, most of these situations come down to we're individuals. We all have our own belief systems, but this interpersonal uh, kind of working together goes a long way. I think when it turns into a battle with the teachers and the teachers are feeling pressure from the outside, I think that's sometimes where it can go negative. Mm -hmm. And I'm afraid this one might be a webinar unto itself too, but <laughs> we'll, we'll give it a quick shot since we only have a few minutes. My son is diagnosed with ADHD. How do I determine if a 504 is better than an IEP? Hmm. That's that's a really good question that kind of turns there. And I think, you know, it's probably, it's kind of a difficult way, you know, without knowing more about the scenario. Yeah. But I think, yeah. you know, some of it may be, you know, how the school is. I think some schools, um, how they handle and kind of work with IEP, IEPs may be stronger than others. I think, you know, in general, the IEP is going to give them some more components and actually some money to back um, what's happened. So I think, you know, the in general blanket with the IEP potentially provides more resources. But I think, you know, in the nature of what we were presenting yeah. is, you know, are those accommodations going to be given in an environment that is more accepted, that kind of keeps their self-esteem kind of up. And I think, you know, if you know other families in the school, if you know other students that have IEPs or 504s, talking with the parents and kind of finding out more about their experience kind of would go a long way. Mm -hmm. um, it's, you know, those decisions. And I think as parents, we always look back at some of the decisions we made and said, I wish I would have done this different or that different. So that is one of those decisions that, you know, you might look back on and feel a little bit differently. But I think the big thing is do what you feel is best for your child at the time. So mm -hmm. do your research, talk to others, talk to the teachers, talk to the school, but you need to make the decision that you're feeling what's best for the child at the time, and then embrace that decision and go forward. If you do go with the 504 and want to you know, change that to an IEP in the future, you can potentially work to the school to do that or vice versa. But I think, you know, make the best decision you can make and kind of work through that. And I think if the school can be accepting and you can kind of accept your child, that's kind of the most important thing as far as that decision goes. Yes, and that is a good point, that if you have a 504 plan, you can up it to an IEP later, right, if necessary? If you get, yeah, if you get to get the diagnosis, um, you can yeah. you can do that. Sometimes you're limited. You don't have the option. Okay. Sometimes the only option that's given would be the 504 plan. Okay. Um, but you do, you know, in some cases, you do have the ability uh, to move that to an IEP. Okay. Okay. And well, again, schools and a lot of times, you know, may advocate for 504s because IOP come with certain restrictions and cost, et cetera, that tie into it. So sometimes you may find the school advocating for the 504. And in your opinion, the IEP may be a better choice. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that was great, Tom. Thanks for joining us today and for contributing your voice to the ADHD community. We, uh, it was excellent. Great. Well, thanks. I really appreciate being able to present today and appreciate all the work that Attitude Magazine does. Um, it's just amazing. I think the community you built and the help that you helped spread out um, to all the people who are affected by you. Hmm. Well, we thank you for that. And for everyone else, make sure you don't miss future Attitude webinars, articles, or research updates by signing up to receive our free email newsletters at attitudemag.com slash newsletters. Next week, our free webinar will be on differentiating auditory processing disorder 
from ADHD in children. We hope you can join us. Have a great day.